going to talk about some really non-charismatic marine life. Um, but before I start, think about your own lives. And if you raise children, you know that what you do with children, you protect them and you let them have independence after many years of um, them wanting it and you saying you're not ready to do this yet. <laughs> and at the same time, you as adults go to work, travel, do what you want. Well, in the ocean, it's just the opposite. It's the young stages that travel and the old ones that stay near home. And I'm going to talk about ways that the young stages and sometimes adult stages of marine life, mostly invertebrates or algae, because I don't know much about fish, <laughs> and, um, can get around the ocean, even though their survival, it, not only their dispersal, but their survival is very much a sweepstakes event. They don't have much of a chance if you look at an individual. Invertebrate development, many species have planktonic larvae, and these can be either feeding or non-feeding. The feeding larvae can feed and grow sometimes metamorphose. Right now there are a lot of barnacle larvae in there. They have different stages. But there are other invertebrate larvae too. We just saw a worm larva swim by. Um, the ones who spend a long time in the plankton, you would expect that the species, the adults of the species they belong to, would have a pretty wide distribution in the ocean. Then there are non-feeding larvae that can spend only a short time in the plankton. Like the one, you big yolky larvae, you can see cilia, little eye spots, but there's no gut. And if there's no gut, they've got to settle in a few hours to a, a few days. So you would expect that invertebrates that have this type of larva or the invertebrates that have what's called direct development, where the fertilized eggs develop into juveniles, like the starfish there, or that's a nudibranch snail. The babies hatch out, well, like, like the whelk capsules that you see. You can often find the little snails from the ones that didn't make it to hatch still inside these cases and they're very tiny replicas of the adults. So, you can see how the planktonic ones do it, but what about the ones that go these other ways? And I'm interested because I work on a group of colonial invertebrates called bryozoans. Now, 95% of them have the non-feeding larvae. That's the larva, one of the very few, you can kind of see its little gut here, that can feed and live for a month or more in the plankton. Those are the adults, the adult colony. Each little dot there is a separate individual and it's on algae, probably uh, laminaria. But once they settle, once the larva settles, it metamorphoses and becomes the first adult of the colony. And then from there it grows asexually, like many plants grow, and just puts out new units, but they can't go anywhere ever again. And if their piece of seaweed dies, they go with it. But meanwhile, they reproduce and produce these planktonic larvae. What's the scale of that? How big are we looking at that adult colony? The adult colony, the individual would be half a millimeter long, each of these little individuals. And there can be thousands of them in a single colony. And of course, they're all connected by pores that um, can allow food transfer and 
I'll talk about Bryas Owens another time in more detail than you probably ever want to hear. But. <laughs> anyway, this is the paradox. Um, many species with non-feeding larvae, this is another species that you find here, often encrusting things like the rocks in the inlet or the worm reef when it's still growing and even when it's dying. The water cipra, it's bright orange at the tips and kind of blackish looking in the middle. And you just look at it and think it's crust. But that's the distribution of water cipra. And you can see up there in the pink is where it's spread to but it couldn't survive. Like the winters are still too cold apparently. At least they were at the time they made this chart. But otherwise, it's pretty much all over in warmer water. So how do these things that don't have long-lived larvae get around? They do it by hitchhiking on some vehicle. Um, it may drift. There may be rafting on larger drifting objects caught up in the currents, and then there's kind of stowing away on something else that moves, whether it's a natural thing that moves, natural, alive vessel, or whether it's an actual ship. Or they can do it by hopping. They don't, may not go far from their parents, but if there's a good habitat a little further within the time they have before they must settle, they can do it in little steps like stepping stones. And then there's creeping, which is what I'll talk about last. Now, um, they can attach to things like the seagrass or a mangrove propagule, like you can see here with some bryozoans in this case attached to it, but many other kinds of things attached to these substrates. And in the lagoon in the winter time, which has kind of gone by now because I was out there looking the past week, you look among the seagrass beds and you see a lot of other things, big masses of seaweed. And this big mass here is actually another bryozoan colony, or maybe two, and two or three. This species kind of looks like wet cellophane noodles. It gets covered with diatoms. It's not really pretty. Nobody eats it, but it can, it can get huge. Um, so these things float around. And you can imagine they float around. They might get broken up. The pieces might survive a while longer. The things that live on them might reproduce and settle where the fragmented piece landed, or this animal itself can come apart and different pieces of it, which are actually all the same genetic individual, can then reproduce sexually. And so the larvae could spread kilometers or miles away from the parents. Um, this is an example that shows one of these drift seaweeds. And you can see that there are a whole lot of plants and animals living on it. In this case, that's a bryozoan up there. These are antiprox. And the good thing about being colonial is if you survive to reproduce, then you're not just an individual. You're actually a founder population if there are enough of you. So colonial things have even better chance of getting someplace they've never been and starting invading, if you want to put it that way, new territory. This is another thing they can do. These are Antarctic bryozoans, and I only have this one terrible picture of them because they've only been seen twice, once in the 1920s and then once in the 1970s. And they managed to collect a few. Apparently, they were drifting past this British icebreaker in the thousands. 
And so they took some pictures, they sent the specimens to someone who described them, and they're just these round spheres, but they're colonies, and the reason they look so fuzzy, besides it's a bad picture from a journal, is they're actually out, with their tentacles are out feeding. So, and they could drift all around Antarctica. So they probably are all around Antarctica, but nobody knows what they look like. Are they attached when they start out? Here's another one. This is a sea squirt, a colonial ascidian or sea squirt. Uh, it's commonly called whale snot in, in the Antarctic. This is what one looks like underwater. It's sort of firm and rounded. And they start off attached, but then they break off and float around, and you can see them at the surface. This is a kind of limp dead one that washed up on the beach, and you can see how big it is. And there are its little individuals within the colony. So there are whole colonies of things that can float around anywhere the wind and current takes them and then probably sink to the bottom or reproduce, produce larvae that soon sink to the bottom and start a new colony. Then there's fragmentation. And I know you've seen this in things like spider plants. If you're a gardener, you see this a lot. But it also happens with corals on coral reefs. There's a storm, pieces break off, and Often those fragments grow into whole new colonies. So instead of one branching coral, you might end up with a whole little patch reef that's actually all the same individual, but its descendants, it's like the spider plant and its descendants. They have no physical connection anymore once they break off, but it's still part of the same genetic individual, which you and I cannot do very well. We might be able to produce clones, twins, identical twins, but we're very bad at what colonial animals are so good at, which is partial mortality. If we lose a big part of ourselves, we're pretty much dead. They can lose a big part. The way the corals break up will lose the whole base, but there's these pieces and they can grow. And this happens with seaweed, like some of the invasive seaweeds like Calerpa. Well, this invaded the Mediterranean. There's a nudibranch snail, one of those shellless sea slugs that eats it. Unfortunately, that just makes more fragments <laughs> and they grow into new Calerpas. Now, I did a study in the 1980s with a, a Danish colleague, and we looked at some bryozoans that live in the sand out around Capron Shoal. They're actually everywhere, but they like shoals with good coarse sand and a lot of energy to keep oxygen going through the sand. And one of them reproduced mostly sexually. That's the one, the round ball larva there. And there's the metamorphosed larva, which produces three little units. And then they start off and form a great big colony with these bristle zoids all over them. And the second one spent most of the colonies we found. And they're easy to find. You take the sand into the lab with seawater and oxygenate it and they pop right up to the surface because they use those bristles. They can actually unbury themselves. So this is one species from Brazil that's even better at fragmenting. It does it in this very even way. It might produce two subcolonies, four subcolonies. They break apart and they're separate, but they're actually still part of the same genetic individual. So that's another way to spread. Now, as far as rafting, and I mean a raft is something bigger than, um, I don't know, big enough to last a while in the ocean. There are over 1,200 species that have been reported from rafting. And 
that kind of shows you the, the size of one of these rafts, which are more common in uh, temperate waters. And the kinds of animals that live on algal rafts are usually ones that have a way to hang on. They can establish themselves and compete with whatever else settled on that piece or pieces of algae. And they can reproduce on it. They can eat it in many cases. So they're feeding right on their raft, which has a finite amount of time. <laughs> and they develop directly so the offspring might stay on the raft and they've been known to go over a thousand kilometers and in fact um, there was a study in New Zealand of uh, the giant kelp and they found it had been able to drift for 60 to 100 days from the sub-Antarctic islands and that's another way to spread your a species can spread itself around. Now, many encrusting and some mobile species can spread by rafting on natural or floating surfaces. Well, natural surfaces, we've got sargasso, we've got sea beans, and I've brought some of these so you can take a look at them. There's sea beans over here too. Um, You've got wood, and this summer, there was a huge amount of pumice washing up on the beaches here. And you may have seen it, looks like a rock, but it's really, really light. And in this one, you can see a tiny tube worm. Most of them had the goose barnacles also, like those on the piece of wood there, but they don't last. You can collect them, but the, you know, they fall off. They fall apart, basically, because their shells are made of pieces. Um, so anyway, we had a lot of the uh, pumice this year, and we also seem to have really different currents. All the sargasso was going to Puerto Rico and Mexico, but all this pumice from volcanoes, which may have been in the, up in the air, or they may have been subsea volcanoes. That was washing up here, and we were getting some floating plastic trash from Mexico. Usually we get it from the Caribbean, from Venezuela, even from Cuba. Um, so the currents were really kind of different this summer, but. Rafting on things that aren't alive, well, you see what happens when a bird eats a lot of the plastic trash. But to a small invertebrate, especially a colonial one, this can be a perfect ride because it lasts much longer than a piece of seaweed. Plus, they don't eat the plastic. At least nobody's found any yet that do. Um, things will break down on an aluminum can pretty quickly, but they takes them a long time. Plastic, it usually it just finally flakes and degrades, but that can take about 10 years in the ocean. And then you still got the little pieces for it to fall to the bottom. Eventually, things can eat them there, or they wash up on the beach, and we have plastic beaches. But that, that was just a really bad picture of some of the little goose barnacles clinging to a piece of plastic. Most of the things that can live on plastic substrates are suspension feeders, things like the, they use either little bristles or ciliated tentacles, and they catch phytoplankton, plant plankton, in the water. So they don't have to eat their substrate. And their substrate, as we know all too well, stays around a long time. So they can really travel around on this. And again, there are many groups of marine life that can do this. The squirt gun has benthic foraminiferans. They're shelled protozoans. And there they are really outlined nicely 
these bubble-like things when you look at them under a magnifying glass or a microscope, you see them. And they're usually the first to recruit onto a floating island of plastic. You also get hydroids, you get corals like these here, you get um, bivalves, oysters, things like that, um, acorn barnacles. Um, it's Nausithoe, I spelled it wrong, but they are belong to, these tubes belong to a kind of jellyfish and they have two stages in their life history. They have a polyp stage which lives on the bottom, it's really small, and it, these little rings show where little medusae, the jellyfish stage, sort of separated off. That's a close-up of a millipora, a fire coral, which used to not be common around here, but it seems to be more of it these days. Circulid tube worms, and of course the bryozoans, which love it, in fact. So far, I think in the Atlantic, we've got at least 26 species that can do this. Um, this species, the, and you'll see this on pieces of plastic, it's, this is dried up, it's sort of purple. It's a, a brighter iridescent purplish color when it's alive. We didn't see this around here until 2002. And then that was on plastic like this, washed up on the South Beach. But the next year, it was settling on settlement plates in the lagoon. And since then, it's just been around. Now, I don't know why it appeared. We all know the water is getting warmer in the ocean. but. There could be other reasons that it's expanding, but it has expanded up the coast. Now, here's a bait bucket with a crab in it. Um, so things that move can often get, find homes in something like a, a plastic container. And even though the animals that live on these substrates aren't usually feeding on them. Fish, and this is actually a shark bite. And I took it to people who know sharks and had them look at it under their magnifying glass. So fish and sharks are gnawing on these pieces of plastic while they're floating around. So certainly predation is going on. So if you want to win the sweepstakes, on a plastic raft or some abiotic raft, wood or uh, sea bean, it's good to be attached. Maybe the things biting may not get you off. It's good to be colonial because then you have a better chance of invading a new place by starting a whole little new population. It's good to be suspension feeding and either brooding your embryos until they can hatch out and be non-feeding larvae and settle right away, or directly develop on the um, substrate. It's also good if you can be self-fertilizing, which in a colony isn't so hard. <laughs> Usually they, the ones I'm talking about reproduce sperm and then eggs, and in the ocean, they, the ones that make the Siphonides larvae would just let them go and they'd be fertilized in seawater. The brooding ones have to wait. The egg stays until the sperm comes to it from wherever, which could be the same colony if there was nothing else around. Or if there are a lot of, if it's on the shore, there's probably a lot of opportunities. But it also helps to have a skeleton, again, when things are gnawing away at you. And then there are the stowaways, a wide variety of marine animals, either attached to ships' hulls or get carried in ballast water. And depending on the climate of the place, the harbor where they land, 
they may survive this whole journey. That was a container ship going into the port here before they sort of changed things around. And this kind of fouling on the ship's hulls can spread invasive species. They're not necessarily bad. This isopod here, which looks a lot like the uh, giant one you've got over here, but it's much smaller, um, was a native of the Indian Ocean. And now it's almost everywhere in warm water. It got to the Western Atlantic around World War II when there was a lot of shipping in between the oceans. Um, but as far as anybody knows, it doesn't bother anything else. You know, it's everywhere, but it hasn't caused anything else to suffer a decline. Whereas the sea squirts, people on the West Coast studied species invading Southern California on the hulls of ships. And those 14 species according to the report, have pretty much taken over, dominate the sea squirt fauna in those particular harbors. They may be here, too. And again, species, marine species, have been traveling around this way ever since ships were invented. So this was a replica ship, a replica of the Golden Hind, and as it sailed along the U.S. West Coast, stopping for tours and so forth along the way, people who study invasive species studied this ship's hull, and they found that the common things fouling the hull, and of course it didn't have all the anti-fouling paint of a modern ship because they were trying to make it really like the old one, and they survived the entire voyage, which was from Oregon to Southern California, I think. And again, ballast water, which we now use in, we don't put rocks in ships for about ballast anymore. It would take a whole quarry. So they use water, seawater. And things can live in that ballast tank and if they get dumped in a place where the climate is similar enough, there's a ship here getting rid of its ballast water right in the port. Um, it can bring a whole assemblage of things. Some of them may be descendants of the ones that started out the trip, either because they can reproduce in there or um, they settle on the walls and grow to a mature size and reproduce. So that's something a lot of people are studying. But, but to tell the truth, it's probably too late most places to tell what was originally native. Mm -hmm. We've been around the oceans too much. OK, there are still a few hitchhikers that like animals to settle on other animals, like the nautilus that swims around in deeper water. But many bryozoans have been reported from nautilus shells. And sea snakes, the same thing. They do slough their scales. But they're pretty, unless you attack one, I know they're poisonous, but unless you attack one, it's going to leave you alone. They're pretty sluggish, so things settle and grow on them. The same thing can happen on sea turtle scoots. Um, OK, so that's rafting or hitchhiking. Then again, if you imagine this was on the sea bottom, species with short-lived larvae can hop from one habitat island to another. And if you were something like a bryozoan colony living on a shell, your offspring might make it as far as the nearest piece of seaweed, or they might make it to the next shell. So that sort of island hopping is another way you can spread, even if your larvae don't stay in the water a long time. So again, you can go 
hop, hop, hop a little bit at a time and end up with a pretty widespread population. This is all being underwater, of course. And the biggest leaps are probably in the deep sea where you have sea mounts that are pretty far separated from each other. You have whale falls, which they have found a lot of organisms living on, or the deep sea vents with their whole community of animals that apparently get from one vent to another in many cases. You can creep. Um, if there are a lot of stretches of similar habitat like sand, you can move um, if you're a movable thing, or you can live on the shells of animals that can move. Now, again, when we did this cupulatriid study that I talked about, we were looking for the free-living colonies that lived on the sand. This is an underwater picture of one of those little colonies, which is about as big as a split pea, a dried split pea, next to a sand dollar. But although the adults would unbury themselves very nicely, we had to look for the juveniles, the very young colonies that had just settled, and the small pieces of fragments to see which way these two species were reproducing. And when we did that, we looked at thousands and thousands of spoonfuls of sand from our samples under the microscope. And in addition to the young cupulatriids, we found all these little bryozoans and tube worms and forams and hydroids and just, again, a whole community of organisms that settled on single grains of sand. This is one of the species from offshore here in Florida. They made tiny colonies. They reproduced sexually after two or three generations. And this is just a diagram of what it looked like in the sand. And because it was so well oxygenated, they could survive a long time. And they could live deep. We made some cores, and they can live deep, you know, this far into the sand. Down here, you could find living ones still. So then, later, many years later, 2002, I was invited to go down and participate in a survey of the marine fauna of Sao Paulo State in Brazil. And this is the little lab that belongs to the University of Sao Paulo down on the coast in San Sebastiano. And again, the people who were sampling, they were sieving the sand on the beach and getting out the big things. And I said, please, can I have some of that sand? And when I looked at it, right away, I found that it also had the same kind of encrusting community. And we're talking a lot of animals in a square meter. Um, again, thousands. And I mean in a square meter, an inch, well, a few centimeters deep, but not, um, not even thinking about what might be still living down below that. And so I looked at them closely and studied them and discovered that there were the same kinds living on those grains as in Florida, but most of them were slightly different in their morphology. They, they looked the same, but with kind of a twist to them. So this one likes to live on ridges of grains. And when I compared them with the ones that lived in Florida, you can see here that they've got four little spines. This is the opening that they would stick their tentacles out. Here is the same thing, and the spines are, in this one, they've got three spines, and they're sort of offset. So it's a relative, a close relative, but not the same species. And again, we found one like this, and. And you can see what I'm talking about. I guess I told someone that the, the membranipros 
were about half a millimeter in length for an individual. You could have three of these guys in half a millimeter. And they live on things like tiny quartz grains and also on shell grains. And again, there's the Florida species and there's the Brazilian species. This one's got more pores in the frontal shell and this one's got fewer. And they've got differences. That one has four spines and that one only has two spines. Um, but they're relatives. Then there are very few species that look the same in both areas. So they may be the same species. Again, it takes probably molecular genetics and um, when we'll get that done, I don't know, but uh, my colleagues in Brazil have extracted DNA from things that small, some of these bryozoans, but we haven't done it yet for the Florida ones. So what does this all mean? Well, here you are, something that can live on a single grain of sand that's a millimeter in size, and yet somehow they've crept their way between Brazil and Florida. How they've done it, I don't know. But it's a recognizable community, which could be pretty widespread because if you look at maps of the sea bottom, you find that in intercontinental shelf regions, like from here to the edge of the shelf or the Gulf Stream, a lot of the bottom is sand. And if these species and other species, because sometimes you get colonies of things that usually live on bigger shell pieces, um, this also can explain the broad distributions of species that either have no larvae or short-lived larvae, the tube worms, the bryozoans, and so on. 